Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode two of Rural Vermont Radio. I'm Ben Hewitt, and I'm here with... Coco Mosley, co-host, and our... Graham Unings Grupernacht. And uh, we're joined by Graham today um, because Graham is, in addition to being Rural Vermont's field organizer, he is also our policy liaison to our policy consultant, uh, Andrea Stander. So he spends a fair bit of time uh, in the state house and monitoring bills that are moving through the state house. Uh, and we thought it'd be great to get a little bit of an update from Graham. So Graham, um, can you tell us a little bit about the bills that have been surfacing uh, this session and, and what you've been working on? Absolutely. Uh, so every session there are countless bills that are going to affect our constituencies, whether they're farmers or consumers or just anybody. And as an organization, you know, we have to make a choice through talking with our constituency, but also our board members and our staff about which pieces of legislation we're going to focus on. And so at this point in the session, we're through what's called crossover, which is a deadline by which bills have to go from one chamber, from the House to the Senate, or from the Senate to the House to stay alive. So we're at a point now where there's been, uh, some bills have, have died, as goes to parlance, and some still have legs, which means they're still alive. So I can talk about the, the remaining bills that we see as being the potentially most impactful, some positively for our constituencies, and some having some potential negative impacts. Um, <clears throat> two of the bills that we're really excited about and we think ha are going to have some positive, positive impacts on our constituency are the Right to Forestry Bill, um, which largely uh, deals with nuisance lawsuits from forestry operations in the state of Vermont and makes it easier to have small forestry operations mm -hmm. and to weather small nuisance complaints or lawsuits. Um, <clears throat> and the other bill is the Ag Enterprise Bill. And this is a bill which Rural Vermont worked on probably starting in September or October with a, a group of stakeholders from the ag community, but also the land planning community. And it seeks to um, make it easier for farms to have accessory on-farm businesses um, and also provide some consistency across the state with how municipalities have to deal, can or can't deal with those businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so that would make it just a much more level playing field for, for people across the state. There wouldn't be this, tremendous variability from one town to another in relation mm -hmm. to what people were able to do on their Absolutely. property. There's, yeah. that, there's that variability between towns with no zoning or very relaxed zoning regulations and then towns with more zoning. And if you're a farmer in, one of the, in certain towns, you can, as it is now, have more leeway to do certain things than in other mm -hmm. towns. Yeah, so let's dive into the Ag Enterprise Bill. Um, in terms of accessory businesses, what are you seeing people wanting to do on their farms? that may or may not be zoned, depending on where you live. Sure. So the main thing this bill does is it makes it so that any town can't outright prohibit any accessory business. So it, it means that they can say, they can't say no, they can say no if you don't do this. So right now we're hearing that people are, in general, it's, it's pretty hard to be a viable farm operation when you're just doing production-based yeah. agriculture. Ain't that I mean, the truth. It's <laughs> sad, sad times, it's right? Really, I mean, but it's sort of interesting that this bill comes from, uh, you know, a really core uh, sort of issue, which is that people can't really seem to make a viable living simply by farming anymore. Absolutely, and that's what we hear over and over again by people coming to give testimony, whether they want to offer um, dinners on their farm around the produce they're growing or the meat they're growing, whether they want to offer educational events on the farm. Some folks um, want to do lodgings and sort of farm stays. What's really important and what we've identified as, as crucial to this bill that satisfies both farmers and municipalities is that there needs to be a nexus between that, on, that accessory business mm -hmm. and the farming operation. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's opened the eyes of legislator, legislators um, to see sort of the struggles of small farms that are trying to make a living farming? Absolutely. I mean, not just legislators, but also other policy influencers in the room, other mm -hmm. organizations who are out there um, you know, seeking their own policy changes for their own constituencies. You know, when you have someone come in and they talk about the real challenges of running their farm and that they, you know, they're turning to this accessory business because, one, because they might want to, you know, educate people around their farm operation, et cetera, but really because of the lack of vi viability of their farm operation. When you see farmer after farmer come in of different sizes, different mm -hmm. scales, different types of farms speaking to this issue, I think that's definitely Yeah, they didn't necessarily get into farming to have a, a bed and breakfast an or, or whatever, yeah. yeah, host weddings. And, and we see farmers are really nimble and able to, you know, kind of learn um, 
new trades and take on new skills, but there is this other real kind of sad point to it that we, um, as a state, are having a hard time supporting viable small farms. Right, and in one sense, I think that's, it indicates that this bill is getting at su supporting people's adaptation to an unsustainable economic system for agriculture. And it really mm -hmm. points us to like, what, what do we do to actually deal with, yeah. that, with that root issue, which is the lack of viability of farms mm -hmm. too? Because this is certainly supportive, yeah. but th and that's a harder question because it really gets at <clears throat> things which state politicians have been telling us, you know, it's, it's harder to affect an economic mm -hmm. system that's mm -hmm. national or global, et cetera. So yeah, if we're thinking at getting mm -hmm. at that core issue, are there other bills that are addressing some of the challenges for small farms? Well, we're hoping that this right to forestry bill can really be help, helpful for people who are integrating forestry operations mm -hmm. on their farms. And in terms of dealing with, we're seeing a lot more folks who are just having conflicts or complaints from neighbors in certain areas of the state. And that yeah. will help with that. And that can be a big issue with shutting down. What kind of nuisance of reports, right? I mean, we, mm. we sort of, um, when we imagine Vermont, and especially Vermont in the winter, forestry is a big part of um, what goes on in this state, but what kind of nuisance complaints are often, farmers getting? They're oftentimes Foresters. associated with noise. Noise, yeah. Yep. Um, Kate Bowen gave some great testimony uh, on this bill. Uh, she farms down in, I believe, Putney. Mm -hmm. um, with her family, and I'd encourage folks, you can find that testimony on the, the Royal Vermont website, I believe, um, or our Facebook page at the very least. Um, so there's been a number of great folks coming to tes testify who are working in the forestry community, either as foresters or as farms who are doing some forestry as part of their farm operation. Mm -hmm. And I think that line between forestry and farm is, mm -hmm. is getting blurred, and, and for a good reason, because um, these are both people, peop groups of people working on the working landscape making a living from the land. Seasonal sort of adjusting. And, yeah, and having yeah. to manage not just your land in relation to what you're growing, but also to your community and, and what's mm -hmm. and facing the repercussions of, of impacts of your mm -hmm. business on the community. Yeah. Is this primarily sort of firewood, lumber, building materials? I think, yeah. I think a lot of the nuisance complaints have come from firewood operations. Yeah, sort of small scale firewood operations where you might be selling cords to your neighbors and Mm -hmm. And it, can you talk a little bit about um, Rural Vermont's position on these, on these, since we're talking specifically about these bills? I mean, we've been basically supportive of these bills and, and I think believe in general that these are a step in the right direction should they actually come to pass. Is that, does that jive with what your, your understanding is? Yeah, the Right to Forestry Bill and the Ag Enterprise Bill, I think, are the two bills we really see as having a positive impact, especially for, for small-scale producers, but really for people in the working lands in, mm -hmm. in general. Um, when we get to other bills, um, the hemp pilot program was something that we were, were Rural Vermont's worked on hemp over time, and we saw this as a, as a potential bill um, because it really would seek to, um, it, it would seek to create a program at the agency of ag which would be, um, which would allow farmers to research more easily research and uh, grow and um, find processing equipment for this industry. And at this point, we, we don't have that carved out at the agency. Um, the hemp bill, however, has gone from a standalone bill to a, a part of a larger bill called the Rural Economic Development Bill, which has gotten bogged down. So, um, you know, as an organization, we look to hemp, you know, not necessarily for a number of reasons, for fibers, for medicines, for oils, um, as a potential product that could help Vermont growers. There's certainly been con some concerns around industrial hemp in Vermont as well, and could become it as a commodity crop. But in general, we think you know that hemp should be grown like a lot of other crops. There's a lot of great value to it, and um, from a rotation crop to a fiber plant, et cetera. And mm -hmm. um, it's just been an issue we've been working on for a while, yeah. and we're just hoping to, to push this Just to rewind a little bit, just forward. in case our, our listeners aren't sure, what's the current status of growing hemp? in Vermont. We get this question a lot at the office, and so I think it's not really readily av available to the public in terms of what um, the laws say right now about hemp production or... Um, sure. Um, so Vermont is one of the f a few states, Kentucky and South Dakota are among others, um, that have provided some means of farmers being allowed to grow uh, agricultural hemp. So at this point, 
farmers are allowed to grow um, in the state of Vermont, but federally, hemp is still considered as associated with cannabis and a, a, a drug, which could be, so if, if the federal government saw fit, um, they could certainly come in and do as they saw fit with a, a hemp operation, is my understanding currently. And there's mm -hmm. both, there's a federal effort now, um, <clears throat> actually by some of the more conservative lawmakers, I think Mitch McConnell, representative of Kentucky, has recently proposed legislation federally that which would make hemp no longer a, a drug. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this state legislation would make it easier for people within the state to access seeds, to access research, um, and to essentially mm -hmm. convert what they can do now, they're allowed to grow in the state, into more, more readily create a product out of it and market it and research what's in the product, the mm -hmm. integrity of the product, et cetera. Has there been a lot of support from Vermonters for this hemp? Um, Bill? You know, like you said, I think we've gotten more calls at the office about hemp over the last year than mm -hmm. almost anything else. Um, and it's oftentimes from, from growers who are interested or also people who like, own a facility that someone wants to use for processing. Mm -hmm. um, so the interest is there. And I think we've also heard, like I said, some concerns um, from, from people about just being displaced through another industrial commodity crop. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what I was going to ask you about because it seems like there is a lot of movement uh, and, and sort of positive, I guess, energy around hemp in the state right now. But we've also heard from a handful of people about the, you know, the potential for sort of unintended consequences of this popularity, which is that concern for displacing perhaps some small-scale grain operations or other, other agricultural operations for the production of hemp. Um, is that something you can expand on a little? It sounds like you, you're certainly familiar with that possibility or with yeah, those I've concerns. Yeah, I've specifically heard from a couple of folks. You know, one, a small vegetable farmer who's been leasing land and was told by the person they were leasing from that in the coming season they want to lease all that land out to uh, hemp farmers and that person's going to need to find new land. And from a, a bread baker who is concerned with uh, Vermont-based uh, grains mm -hmm. supplies. You know, and to some extent, I think from an organizational perspective, um, <coughs> You know, it's sort of like corn. I think there's 90,000 acres in Vermont or something in corn right now. And as a commodity crop, you know, it clearly takes up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this... And it's responsible for a lot of the, <coughs> of the pesticide and... Sure, there's a lot of management issues associated with corn which have environmental impacts or human health impacts or wildlife health impacts. And I sense, think in a sense, like, whether it's hemp or corn or other annual commodity crops, we, we have to look at them... As an organization, we can support saying that, yes, of course, you have the right to grow corn or you have the right, should have the right to grow hemp, but how you grow it and how it um, integrates with the rest of our <laughs> social and e agricultural ecology needs to be mm -hmm. considered as well so that we can have healthy, thriving farms that aren't yeah. just dominated by an industry or one yeah. crop. So it's just not another replacement for large-scale um, corn production. Or sure. So we can still have local grains and a, a veggie farmer be able to find land to grow on. I'm curious what, uh, where things are at with the, there's been, I think, a, a, uh, over the years, a couple of different itinerations of a regenerative ag bill. Uh, and I know that there's something, at least in process right now, and maybe you could just touch on that real briefly. Absolutely. I actually testified last week, I think, in the Senate Agriculture Committee about this. So over the last few years, like Ben said, there's been a few different uh, quote-unquote regenerative ag or regenerative soils bills out. Um, you know, rural Vermont has certainly been supportive and excited about testimony we've seen in the state house conversations we've seen within and without the state house that regard like just that people are beginning to become more aware of the po potential positive impacts of agricultural methods from sequestering carbon to protecting and improving water quality to improving wildlife habitat um, to you know growing more nutrition in foods so we're glad that those conversations are happening and people mm -hmm. see that <clears throat> but the the challenge has been you know how are we going to incentivize producers to take on these practices. And what's come forth have been a couple of different certification efforts. Last year there was a regenerative soils certification, and this year there was um, an attempt to get the new Rodale organic add-on in place as law in Vermont. Um, and you know, both of these certifications would require certifying bodies, which requires funding. And we mm -hmm. also felt as an organization that <clears throat> we really need to understand what, how do farmers and community members in Vermont want to define regenerative. Is it just going to be about soil health? Uh, is it going to talk about farm worker quality of life? 
uh, in the social regenerative nature of things? Is it going to talk about economic regenerative quality? Like, are you able to sustain yourself economically? Or are you dependent on something else? Um, and if it is just going to be about ecological uh, regeneration, then what are the qualities we need to be measuring? And is there real, has there been enough stakeholder input on it? And from our perspective, over the last couple of years, the bills that we opposed didn't have enough stakeholder input. This year, what's happened is this uh, Vermont Environmental Stewardship Program, which is a program that the Agency of Agriculture has been running. It's a pilot program. Um, it's been in the works for a couple of years. And I think this is the first year they're going to roll out with it. They've substituted that program into as the regenerative ag piece of legislation. So essentially, it would make um, it would codify this program as a not just an Agency of Ag program, but as a legislatively endorsed program which takes about 10 to 12 people per year and um, if you comply and you uh, come in alignment with all their tests for environmental quality then you get a sign on your farm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like my testimony was essentially that you know rural Vermont's not going to stand in the way of this program we think any program out there that's that has some decent ways of improving farm practices and if farmers want to engage with those programs, psh, we're not going to stand in the way. But in general, we feel like the crisis is such environmentally in relationship to agriculture and socially, economically in relationship to agriculture that we need more than this. We need real incentives that actually compensate farmers for the values that they are creating in terms of water or in terms of soil or in terms of mm -hmm. animal health or nutrition. Um, and also that hold people accountable if they're doing mm -hmm. the detrimentally. So, you know, mm -hmm. how, we, it's just not enough and, um, we don't know. We don't have the answer for mm -hmm. what that needs to look like, but that's the conversation we need mm -hmm. to be having. In our opinion, it gets back to our original conversation mm -hmm. about um, farm viability. Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead, no, I was, just, I was just in hearing you talk about that. You know, trying to develop that mechanism for acknowledging and maybe even compensating farmers for that value. It occurs to me that we talk a lot about the ways in which our economy tends to externalize the environmental costs associated with with uh, you know more industrialized forms of agriculture. But um, we're also sort of uh, perhaps externalizing the environmental benefits in the sense that we aren't even acknowledging or recognizing those for people who are actually, whose practices do actually, are actually nurturing to the environment and mitigating climate change and healing the land and, and building mm -hmm. soil. You know, those benefits, you know, they, they, they stay with the farmer, but they're, they're much larger than that, too. They're really a benefit to society as a community whole. community benefits. That's right. Yeah. And, and we're, not, we're we... also externalizing that in the sense yeah. that we're not acknowledging it. And mm -hmm. we're seeing the repercussions of that right now with the lake and otherwise. But sure. From decades, you know, and I don't mm -hmm. think we can expect to clean it up in a matter of just a couple of years. Mm -hmm. and, and just as saying, you know, because you're mentioning some of these things that make me think, you know, one of the things we also said in testimony on this bill was that, and we've said for a few years, is we really need methods of compensating people who are already exemplary farms. Because mm -hmm. a lot of NRCS funding and otherwise goes to farms that really need to improve their methods. And I, and I should say rightly so, you know, farms that have problems should really be, need to be, be improving those problems, there should be funding. But also folks who are doing that work and have been from the beginning mm. are not being compensated and don't have any method for continuing to be incentivized to do those practices. Or in that sense, they're losing their farm viability and mm -hmm. they're not there's no compensation outside of potentially organic certification or some other label. And um, in terms of a new label, we just haven't figured out if that's really the path that farmers want to take to get compensated for this. Right. And, I, you know, I think as, as an organization, we have been a little bit um, agnostic on the issue of more certification. It, you know, I, don't, I think it's probably safe to say that we're not... Um, we don't... We, generally speaking, have not been necessarily supportive of, of adding yet further certification processes to mm -hmm. the plate of um, farms that are often, you know, really overextended as it is, um, mm -hmm. unless there are really, really very, very clear benefits. Um, it, and do you see this, where do you see this regenerative ag bill? This, the one that's, that's moving through right now, this, is this still primarily a soils bill, uh, similar to the ones that have preceded it? And um, is it, does it um, have legs, as you mentioned <laughs> earlier? Yeah, no, I think it, it does. It's, it's interesting. I don't think any, no one wants to stand in the way of a program that could potentially improve practices, I think. But at the same time, most people who are testifying are saying, um, this isn't enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, 
this this bill certainly focuses exclusively on soil health and um, ecological measures of regeneration or sustainability. And again, those are really good things to be measuring. And I think there should be a broader discussion on what are the metrics we're going to use to balance to measure this and to for our standard. Because if we're going to mm -hmm. say these are like the best of the best, um, are the tests actually showing that? Or are we just sort of mating, making medi mediocrity mm. the sort of best that yeah. we're? Yeah, so if somebody who's listening wants to mm. have some input in this bill or in the other bills that, that are shaken right now, um, how would they go about doing that? Sure. Um, well, there's a few different ways. If you are specifically interested in a particular bill, you can, I think, number one, you can call or email Rural Vermont and ask to talk to myself, Graham, or um, I think that would be the best. Mm -hmm. And I can either directly um, talk with you about how you can get involved. That may, be, that may include giving testimony in, in person. It may include giving testimony written. Uh, if you are not someone who wants to, feels like that's the way you can participate, there's certainly other opportunities in which you can support our organization at helping to get more people's voices heard on this issue as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, you know, just start by contacting us and, you know, we can direct you as best we can based on your own interests and skills. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and if you have specific uh, questions about other bills or other work that Rural Vermont is doing or you want to see us doing, feel free to email rvr at ruralvermont.org. That inbox has been flooded, by yes. the way, Coco. <laughs> I'm having a hard time wading through all the queries. So, But we will get to yours, if yep. I promise. Um, um, so yeah. yeah, please be in touch with if, if you have questions or comments. Um, Graham, thank you for your time. And we'll definitely have you, once the session maybe wraps up, um, we'll have you back on and, sure. and to sort of get the lay of the land at that point. Yeah. Um, can I Great. speak to one other bill before? Please oh, do. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I was trying to be short, but yeah. um, the pollinator, there's a pollinator protection bill that I thought would okay. be worth mentioning, just because it's something that's been happening for a few years on and off, and um, you know, members of the community have not, have felt like bills have been insufficient, and um, at this point, this would be a bill we'd love to, that, that you can make your voice heard right now on at the State House. Uh, this bill is currently, uh, let me just check really quickly. I believe it's still in the Senate Ag Committee, and it's been changed to H904, if you're interested. Um, so this is the Pollinator Protection Bill, and it specifically seeks to regulate neonicotinoid pesticides in the state, and it's been incredibly weakened throughout the session. Um, and we're sensitive to farm viability issues associated with the cost of seed and um, challenges that farms have because they've sort of grown into, via the industry, the use of neonicotinoid-treated seeds. Um, but homeowners as well across the state for treating ornamentals mm -hmm. have been using this. And the mm -hmm. evidence uh, points to not just significant pollinator um, damage, but also broader insect and ecological damage associated with these pesticides. And um, the bill's a little weak light in that right now. It originally asked for, um, it required that seed dealers not only carry treated seed, but also untreated seed, which actually makes it possible for farmers and mm -hmm. other growers to choose untreated seed. Um, but that provision has been struck. So at this point, it's really just a bill calling for a public education campaign mm -hmm. around neonicotinoids adjudicated by the Agency of Agriculture. Mm. Um, and there's not much else to it right now. So given that, what what would people be, should people be doing? Sure. Uh, to get in touch with the uh, Pesticide Action Network or ourselves at Rural Vermont, we can direct you to some, there's some letters going around circulating, uh, which is suggesting some new language to be added to the bills, specifically language which was recommended highly by the Pollinator Protection Committee, which was a legislative con legislatively convened committee to address this issue. And their recommendations have really not been being addressed or listened to. So we could help direct you to uh, petitions to sign on to, um, evidence, if you're looking just to learn more about the topic, we can get you, we can, you know, hopefully get you in for, to provide testimony if that's something you're interested in. Um, but I really just wanted to make this bill, make you aware of this bill because um, it's something that our community has been interested in over the years and there's another iteration of it right mm -hmm. now and it's just and not so sufficient. And so people's input could be really valuable here as the bill gets stripped <clears throat> away. Absolutely. It becomes less... Um, Right. We're seeing, That's powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. We're seeing other interests sort of strip it away. And mm -hmm. if you feel like your voice, yeah. if you want to make your voice heard now is an opportunity. And is that sort of lobbyists for um, that are stripping away some of the protections or? 
You know, I, I would have to pass on who specifically yeah. has been giving testimony. I know that um, there have been some feed dealer organizations and they're giving testimony. The Agency of Agriculture has been giving testimony. Um, but I, I, I'd ref defer that question to our consultant, Andrea sure. Stander. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again, Graham. So that email again, Coco, is? rvr at ruralvermont.org. And we would love to hear from you. And I think, I believe in our next episode, we are going to be joined yeah, um, we by are Lindsay Harris. Yeah, we are going to Mountain have Farm. Lindsay. Yep. Yep. So awesome. she'll be talking to us about what's going on in Tunbridge. And she's someone, you know, whose, um, I think, operation and, and livelihood really has been directly impacted by uh, previous legislative sessions and what has mm -hmm. resulted uh, from those sessions. So it'll be really interesting to talk to her about um, that impact on her, on her farm and livelihood. Yeah. So thanks again, Graham. Thank you, Coco. And thank you all. See you soon. All right. <laughs>